Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Who's having fun at 20 Books Vegas? All right. We're here to learn some cool stuff today. My name's Kevin McLaughlin. Uh, some of you guys know me, some of you don't, but I'm one of the admins for the 20 Books to 50K Facebook group, and i uh, been doing this for, oh, like a little over a decade now in terms of the publishing part of things. And I've been full-time at this for about four years. So today, I'm going to be going over the five pillars of publishing, which is basically the fundamentals. If you can master these fundamentals, then you pretty much have a 100% chance of success as an indie. OK. Yeah, this is the secret sauce here, folks. Th that's, that's OK. Don't worry. There's actually a lot of work involved, too. So, <laughs> All right. Success at writing and publishing is challenging. It's hard, but we can make it easier. There are five basic principles which, if managed successfully, boost our odds of success. This isn't the only model that can achieve success, but it's a good one. So that's important to keep in mind, too. Um, there's lots of ways to the top, and there's lots of different tops. So this is one of those things where you're going to be able to take away from it the pieces that are going to work for you and leave the pieces that don't behind. That said, I've never seen someone master all five pillars and fail to make a living from their writing. Not in 10 years of doing this, I have not seen a single person master all five of these elements and fail. So it is a good road, <laughs> even though it's not the only one. The more of these we gain mastery and the stronger our overall chances of success become. So for instance, somebody might master one and then they get really, really lucky and they go out and they, they sell a, a ton of books and they're highly successful and they don't really understand exactly why. And then you have somebody who maybe has mastered three. And, and that's somebody who has a really good chance that anything they launch is going to actually do OK. And they're going to have some successes and some failures. And they're starting to learn what is working and what's not. And then you have somebody who's mastered all five pillars. And that's the sort of person who very rarely does a book not do well. Now, they might have some books that do great and other books that do, yeah, OK, good. But they very rarely have books which flop or, or fail because they've mastered the fundamentals. And that's what we're going to work on today. The first pillar is storytelling. And I put this one first because this is key. If you don't have the storytelling down pat, everything else falls apart. You can, you, you can mar try and market a bad story, and you can actually get people to buy it. But they're not going to buy book two. They're never going to come back and read your other books. So storytelling is the, the most important of the fundamentals. It's not about grammar or spelling. It's not about purple prose. It's about taking readers on a journey and capturing their minds. It's also about creating an emotional resonance between you and the prose you're writing and the people who are reading it. You want them to feel something. That's one of the keys to making storytelling work. Why just good? Why do you think just good? Good is enough. It doesn't have to be great storytelling. There's, there are tons of good books which have done excellent uh, on the marketplace. Now, should we always strive to do excellent? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I want to write a great book, right? I want to do great storytelling. And we're always learning, and we're always working on trying to reach that next level in everything. But good is actually good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. I think Craig had a great talk on uh, perfection being a problem <laughs> in this business, and he's not wrong. Uh, sometimes people push so hard to do everything perfect, they don't want to release the book until it's flawless. And the truth is, none of our books are flawless. I'm 75-ish uh, books into my career, and my books that I pub my, the book I'm, I'm publishing tomorrow uh, is not flawless. It, it still has some rough edges. It will still not be as good as something I'll write two, three years from now. Ideally, we're always learning and always improving. You want the readers to fall in love with the characters. You want them to turn the page. Uh, one of the best kinds of reviews that I ever get is the one that says, I stayed up all night reading this book. I couldn't put it down. That makes 
that just that just makes my day when I hear that stuff. You get them to turn the page and you've got them hooked. You they, they'll they'll love you. They'll come back for more because that's what they're looking for. And like I said before, we want to be getting better all the time. The second pillar is packaging. I originally split this off into two different pieces, but I've merged it now into, into packaging. And packaging includes a bunch of different stuff. It is just the art of producing a professional looking product. Our ideal goal should be that our books wouldn't look out of place on a Barnes & Noble shelf, or what, pick your whatever bookstore you want. We want to produce product that looks just as professional as all of the New York City big presses. We want to produce product that looks like a book that readers are going to want to buy. Packaging includes things like formatting, the interior, cover art, and book description. Other elements too, like uh, Amazon just added their, their A-plus content. That's a piece of the packaging now as well. Uh, you might see some authors using editorial reviews. That's a piece of packaging as well. So there's lots of little pieces to it, but there's two core elements of packaging which drive what AIDA, A-I-D-A, attention, interest, desire, and action. ADA is a, a common marketing term, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit in this pillar. Covers are more than just pretty art. The purpose of this cover is to convey the story idea. In the, the ADA setup, it's to grab their attention. So they're scrolling through Amazon looking for their next book. You want something that grabs their attention, makes them stop, and makes them click. Not only that, but you want the image to convey the story. So you look at an Avengers movie poster. You know what it's about. You, everyone can look at that and know instantly what it's about without, you know, in, in two seconds. Look at uh, movie posters for horror films. If you pick one, if you put one horror movie film among like a dozen other posters and ask, everyone in the room here to pick out the horror movie, everyone will get it right. And that's because Hollywood spends an enormous amount of money studying exactly what makes their viewers tick and creating triggers that engage the reader's understanding. Uh, different, uh, different fonts tell readers what the story is gonna be like. Different types of imagery tell the readers what the story is gonna be like. Uh, really famously, there was a military science fiction author who was writing these stuff about big space fleet battles and stuff, great books. And every single one of his books, uh, this back in the 90s, every single one of his books had guys in power armor, like space marine type guys on the front covers. And he complained to his publisher. He's like, what, what, what's, there are no space marines in my books. It's all spaceship battles. And they're like, that is the shorthand for what military science fiction is. That, at that particular moment in time, was the shorthand that told readers this is a military science fiction book. If it was spaceships on the cover, that would have told them that it was a space opera instead. So it's important to create something that is similar but different based on the other books that are very much like yours. It's not about creating a book that has an exact replica of a scene from your story on the cover. Uh, it's not about having the prettiest artwork on the cover. It's mostly about telling readers what the story is about and what the subgenre is at a quick glance. And I just went through all of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, packaging, sales description. We've got their attention with the cover. So now we need to get their interest. Descriptions are those bits about the book on the back cover. They're crucial to acquiring readers, especially in today's world where everybody's buying off of Amazon. And that description is the thing that turns the click into the buy. Writers have plenty of practice writing synopsis of stories, especially old guard writers who have been around for a long time. 
you know, we, we had to write synopsis, send it into the agents in the hopes that somebody would someday pick up our books. Thank God those days are gone, right? <laughs> reading a synopsis is boring, though. Readers don't want to read a synopsis. Book descriptions aren't a synopsis, they're sales copy, and they should be written with good copywriting. So, again, I'm going to switch over to a Hollywood model here for a second and say that what your book description is, is it's a written form of a movie trailer. You know how when you watch a, a good movie trailer, at the end of that you're like, oh my god, I really want to watch that film. That's what your book description should do. That's the whole point. That's everything that the book description is designed for. It is a movie trailer in written form. And if you've ever watched a movie trailer and been like, yeah, okay, I've just seen the entire movie already, that's a bad book description. <laughs> and that's one, that one's not going to convert well. So you want to look at the movie trailers and see what's working on them and look at the best-selling books in your genre and see what they're doing as well. A uh, little, little secret here. Back when I was first trying to really figure out book descriptions, I went and grabbed the book descriptions of all of the top-selling books in my genre, and I went and rewrote my descriptions using them as a template. So uh, none of the same words. I didn't plagiarize anything, but sentence with bold print as a good tagline. Okay, good. And, and now this happens. Here's the character, and here's what he's doing, and this happens. And, and I just templated right off of that. Now, these days, I actually don't need to do that anymore because I've just done so many of them. Um, but it's a good way to get some practice if you're struggling with this. Go grab the ones that are like you, that are doing really well, because let's face it, if they're in the top 100 and they're in your genre, they're selling like hotcakes, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is probably because their cover and their sales copy is good. The third pillar is promotion. And uh, there have been a ton of classes about promotion here, so we're going to touch on this in a kind of limited manner. But you cannot guarantee success as an author today without doing some sort of promotion of your works. Different authors are going to do different things, and some authors do succeed without promoting their books at all. They just put the books out, and that's it. They're done. And I know some of the people who do that um, usually they've doubled down on some of the other pillars and they're leaving this one behind. Remember I said, if you have all five, you're guaranteeing success. If you have four, you know, you're probably going to be okay, and three, a little bit less so. The less pillars you have mastery of, the less pillars that you're fully utilizing, the less your odds of breaking out, the less your odds of reaching the sort of success that you're aiming for. So everything about AIDA, the attention with the cover, the interest with the book description, which builds the desire to pick up the book, and then they, the action is the last piece where, it's where, they, where they click and they buy. Everything about AIDA helps conversions, but in order to convert, we need to get eyes on the sales page. We need to get readers there. And promotion is anything that we do to accomplish that. Any means we use to accomplish that goal is good. All right, let me say that again, because that's really important. Anything we do which drives eyeballs to the sales page is a good thing. There's, there's, an, old, there's an old saying there that there's uh, uh, publicity and there's good publicity. There's no such thing as bad publicity. It, it <laughs> it's still largely true. Uh, anything we do which drives eyeballs to the sales page is helping us because some of those eyeballs will convert and obviously if our cover and our description are excellent they'll convert at higher numbers but that's where the the pillars all kind of come together and cooperate with one another and build on each other targeted promotions are best the idea is that if we can bring pre-qualified leads that's much better if uh, I have um, somebody who writes the same genre as me do a cross promotion. I promote their book, they promote mine. There's a couple of authors I know who do uh, a really dynamite job of writing uh, the, same si the same kind of books as I have. And uh, I know 
that my readers are going to love hearing about their latest release, and they know that their readers are going to love hearing about my latest release. That sort of thing is solid gold, because um, those are extremely targeted results. That's the, 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 the best kind of promotion you can do. But anything you can do um, is still effective. It's just the less well-targeted, the less impact it's going to have. There's also free promotions. Um, paid promotions almost, almost always work better and faster, but free as possible. So you're trading cash for sweat equity. Um, like, this is a TikTok is huge these days, right? Everybody's talking about TikTok and book talk as the latest way to sell lots and lots of books, at least in a lot of genres. Uh, but there's sweat equity involved. You have to put up a lot of videos <laughs> before you're going to start getting serious traction there. And it's a lot easier to throw up a, an Amazon ad or a Facebook ad, but that costs money. So you can trade back and forth. You're looking at trading sweat equity for initial capital investment. The more, of the, the more capital you can put into it, the less sweat, sweat equity is involved, and, and vice versa. Stand out. So free promotion, standing out from the crowd is important because everybody's doing it, right? Everybody's on Twitter saying, buy my book, and it doesn't work. You have to find ways to actually stand out from the group, and you have to offer something of value. People don't stay unless you give them something that they want or need, and a lot of what they're looking for when you're doing the free types of promotion is you. They want to build a connection with you, the author. So you need to actually show them a little bit about yourself. You need to give them something of you. And, and it never hurts to actually give them, give them something, too. Uh, a free novella, a free short story. Um, these sorts of things are a great initial contact. Uh, remember that publishing books is promotion. One of the best promotional tools is the next book. And like I said, there's some people who publish so fast that that's the only promotion that they ever do. And it works great. Um, so publishing at a pace, at a faster pace, is its own form of promotion. Which brings us to productivity. <laughs> productivity is the next pillar. And the old days of like the 90s, I mean, I think everybody in the room here knows that you know, like a book a year is kind of passe at this point, right? By the time a year has gone by, um, most of your readers, most of the time, have forgotten about you if you haven't published anything at all. Um, the world has increased in pace, and we need to kind of increase in pace with it. Now, that doesn't mean you have to write a book a month. Um, you can. <laughs> there are people who do, but it doesn't mean you have to. Productivity, working to build our own productivity and improve it over time is the key. Every book is another chance to win new fans. Every book helps us achieve a living income from our work. The whole point behind 20 books to 50K was originally that 20 books at $7.50 a day would let Michael retire to Mexico. <laughs> and, um, you know, like obviously he, he did a few more than that. But the more books that we produce, the more different places of contact our readers have, and the more chances they have to, to, to find us. Becoming prolific is probably beyond the scope of a short talk, but I write a million words a year. Um, did last year, doing it again this year. I, I'm actually, uh, I run a group of people who are currently working our way up to two million words a year. That's the long-term goal. Um, I don't know if we're ever gonna reach it, but it's fun. No, you don't have to type <laughs> two million words a year to do this. That's just me having fun. So, but some quick tips. Uh, ground effect. Write every day if possible. Every day you can, if not. Not everybody can write every day. Not everybody's life fits that. But writing frequently helps tell our brain that this is an important task that we need to be focused on. So there's something called neuroplasticity. And I'm, I'm not going to go too much into the biology stuff. But the th whatever we work on more, our brains actually adapt and reshape the neural pathways over time to make us better at that thing. And the more often we do the thing, the more neuroplasticity changes our brain structure to make us better at that thing. It, literally, just sitting down and writing for 15 minutes a day 
tells your brain, oh, this is a thing I need to be working on. This is something I need to be paying attention to. Whereas sitting down for a big four-hour sprint once every two weeks isn't doing the same thing because we're not getting the regular routine contacts. So that's why I, I usually advocate for doing a, a, at least a little bit of writing as often as you can. That's the ground effect. Belief. How many people here think that they could write a million words if they really, really put their minds to it? Excellent. Wow. That's in a year. A million words in a year. Sorry. All right. So there's still some hands. Good. All right. <laughs> you can. If you write a thousand words an hour, which is a, a, not an atypical pace for folks, that's a, a thousand hours of work. If you work 50 weeks out of the year, that's 20 hours a week. If you work five days a week, that's four hours a day, which means you're putting in four hours a day, five days a week, 50 weeks a year to produce a million words. And that's at a fairly sedate pace of 1,000 words an hour. I know people who do three, four times that. Um, so it is definitely possible. Whether or not you want to is another question. You don't need to, to be that productive. You don't need to be that prolific. But it is within the realm of possibility. And that means that if you want to write four books a year, 400,000 word books a year, hey, that's totally doable. If you can do a million words, you can definitely do 400,000. So belief, believe that it is possible. And that's one of the key parts. Practice is the next key element. Writing is like exercising. If I tried to run a marathon tomorrow, I would break myself. All right, if I tried to write a book tomorrow, I would break myself. I could probably do it. I've written 29,000 words in a day before. I could probably do more. I have a friend who did 43,000 in a day once. Um, and I've never done that many, but I could probably do it in a pinch. But I would break myself. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not able to do that without doing damage. So practice means building up slowly. If I want to run a marathon, say, next summer, I'm going to start running now, and I'm going to start running a couple miles a day, and then I'm going to expand it to maybe three miles, and then I'll expand it to start doing five-mile runs, and I'll keep on pushing myself and increasing the mileage, and I'll keep on working my way up slowly toward being able to run that marathon. And likewise, if you want to write 6,000 words a day, you can do it. But you need to start where you're at. And if you're writing 500 words a day right now, and you decide you're going to start writing 6,000 words a day tomorrow, you're probably going to hurt yourself. And even if you don't, you're probably going to end up getting disappointed or frustrated. What I usually, now again, I, I caveat that with saying, yes, there are some people who can just go and walk in the first day and just do 6,000 words. And, and they're, that's great. Um, but most of us will struggle jumping up from 500 to 6,000 like that. It's better to slowly increase it over time, to slowly build on your past successes. If you're doing 500 words a day, great. Maybe we can push that up to 750 next week. And then after a week or two of that, we'll push it up to 1,000 words a day and just slowly increase it over time. Writing is a marathon, not a sprint. Now, I put a little caveat at the bottom here. Never sacrifice quality for productivity. Our aim is to delight readers and be prolific. Because remember, back to storytelling, that number one pillar. If that breaks, nothing else we do will help us. Our storytelling has to be solid. Because if it's not, all of the rest of this stuff is basically a waste of our time. And the last pillar, this is actually the new pillar. This one replaced uh, cover and, and, and book description were my original plan for what the pillars were. And I was like, no, those are both packaging. Uh, but progress, progress is an important thing that we don't actually talk about enough in this business. And um, in a lot of ways, that's why we're all here this week, right? We're all here to expand our, our, our businesses. We're all here to learn new things. And that's part of progress. Because nothing stays static. Everything in life is either improving or declining. Our friendships are getting stronger or weaker. Our uh, physical fitness is getting better or, or weaker. Um, our writing is getting 
better or weaker. Our bonds with our readers are getting stronger or weaker. Um, our email list is getting stronger, or we've forgotten to send an email for the last six months, and oops. Uh, <laughs> you know, th then we've got a problem, because now over that time frame, that's gotten, that particular tool has gotten weaker from disuse. The marathon, not a sprint thing comes in here because these skills, all of these pillars, can take time to learn and master, and that is okay. You don't need to do it all right, right this second. You don't need to do it all overnight. You, the whole point of this journey is to learn over time the things that you need to know to reach success. And understand that it's not going to come overnight for most of us. Uh, it, it took me seven years, guys, to go full time. And I was working hard to make it happen. I, I made pretty much every mistake imaginable <laughs> on my way up through. Uh, I just sat there and I learned from them and I did not give up. I am, the I am the poster child for the five pillars because I screwed most of them up. <laughs> and then I learned to do them better and eventually that led me to being able to go full time as a writer and you know, be where I am. Lifelong learning is so important to our careers, folks. Not just because it gives us new methods of advertising, new methods of reaching readers, new methods of connecting with people, new types of stories we can tell, but just be also because it, it, anything we learn can, ed, can inform our future books at some point. When I was like uh, 20 years old or so, there was a big flood in our town, and I remember seeing a bunch of cars underwater and all of them had their headlights on. And I asked, I found out why that happened. And it turns out that the water actually connects some little circuit and turns the lights on and then drains the car's batteries. So that actually showed up in a story at one point where the car is slipping down into darkness <laughs> in, a, in a frozen lake and the headlights turn on as it's descending. Everything that we learn is fodder for our stories. Somebody once said that art is the connection of different elements or points in a new way. So we're connecting the dots between these different things in a new way. That's art. And so all of the things uh, that we're learning are dots. We're just dot collecting. And go out there and collect dots. <laughs> and then find new ways to put them together. Don't be afraid to experiment with new methods. I always like trying new software. Um, I'm, I'm the first person to hop in with things like Atticus when it starts coming out. I'm the first person to hop in with uh, Kickstarter. I was one of the early attempts at a book Kickstarter and I did not make it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it, but I, I, I'm, I'm always willing to try this stuff out and test it and see what happens and then learn from my mistakes and hopefully do it again better next time. Don't be afraid also to say, I tried that, but it's not working for me. Maybe dictation is not for you, and everybody's saying, oh, it's, the, it's the, the great thing. Maybe it's just not your great thing. Try it. Give it a, a solid shot, but if it's not working, drop that thing and find the things that do work for you. If TikTok is not your thing, it does not matter how many authors tell you that TikTok is the hot new thing and everybody has to get on it. Try it. If it's not your thing, if it doesn't work for you, drop it. Move on. Sometimes learning can require us mo to move outside of our comfort zones. The strongest lessons that I get tend to be the ones that make me feel the most uncomfortable. Uh, Becca Symes has a way of doing that to me. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> she has a habit of doing that to me. <laughs> um, and that's good, because if it makes me really uncomfortable and makes me sit down and think and kind of grumble about it for like an hour or two, then I probably have really actually learned an important lesson there, and I need to think about it some more. Uh, stepping outside of our comfort zones and trying new things that, are, that feel a little bit awkward. Uh, getting up on stage in front of a room full of people to talk about writing. You know, uh, most of you may have done that. Some of you may have done that. Some of you might not have. Some of you are going to be up here on these stages at some point in the future. 
talking about your processes and stuff. When you get that opportunity, take it. It doesn't have to be perfect. People want to hear what you have to say, and the act of doing the thing that makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable is actually going to also help you grow. So, to conclude, this is not the only road, but it's a good road. Remember AIDA, attention, interest, desire, and action. We're driving eyeballs, we're getting attention with our book covers, we're getting interest with our book descriptions, which are movie trailers, where the interest is building the desire in the reader to buy the book, and then the action of purchasing it. Get eyes on the sales page to convert them, write well, and write lots. Progress is important, nothing stays still. We're always either improving or declining, so remain open to learning. And I've never seen someone master all five of these key elements and fail to achieve writing success. But the way we master them and execute them will vary from one writer to another. So no two people's mastery of the pillar of storytelling is gonna be identical because we all have our own writer voices. No two writers' mastery of promotion is gonna look identical because we're, do using, you, we're using different tools. One person might be a straight up, I do Facebook ads and that's it. Another person might be, oh, I, I do book bubs. You know, another person might be, I do TikTok. And some people might do a combination of a bunch of things. And that's okay, all of those work. And you can download these slides here. I saw some people uh, taking photos, but you can download the slides if you wanna. And now we're going to open things up for some questions. Uh, if you'd like to ans ask a question, please come up to the microphone up front and speak loud into the mic. I am here for whatever questions you guys would like to have. This is either going to be a softball question or a question you can't easily answer. Uh -oh. <laughs> For a relatively new author, how do I prioritize what pillars to focus on first? And where do I apply my limited time amongst those five buckets. Thanks. Wow. That's not a softball question. <laughs> Where are you in the book creation process? That would be the, the follow-up question for that. Um, if you haven't written a book yet, I would recommend working on storytelling. If you're getting ready to publish, then building some mastery of cover and packaging, you know, your packaging elements is probably key. Uh, if you're ready to do a rapid release on a whole trilogy, getting some mastery of the promotional aspect is probably really important because that rapid release isn't gonna do you a lot of good if you don't have the, uh, if you don't have some kind of promotion driving eyeballs to the page. So I, I think it sort of depends on where you're at as to which one you should be working on more. Does that make sense? Other questions? Come on, folks. I'll ask a question. So you said it took a while for you to get to uh, the point you made a lot of mistakes and everything else. Um, I'm sure a lot of people, as they go along their own personal journeys, they have those eureka moments. So. Can you kind of describe when you had those eureka moments of, of the aha, you know, like, okay, I'm supposed to do this a little bit better, or I didn't do this. Uh, was it a gradual thing? Was it all at once? Or, you know, could you, I guess, describe that a little bit more? Sure. Um, it was, I would call it a state, a bunch of different eureka moments. Um, one of them was uh, finding Dean Wesley Smith's blog and uh, reading his, his, his old Sacred Cows. This is back in like 2008 when I found him. Um, and he was kind of a mentor for me in my early writing days, working up to my publishing my first stuff. Um, and finding out from him that, you know, like uh, finding out from him what Heinlein's rules were um, was, was a major, major thing for me. And then actually incorporating those into my writing process, that was an even bigger deal. Um, then there was a, a, 
a writer uh, in one of the early 20 bookers uh, who sadly uh, passed away, who gave me the advice that catapulted me from making a couple hundred dollars a month to making four figures a month, and I've never been less than that. Uh, he was like, you're doing your covers wrong here, and you're doing the, uh, you know, you, you need to, to release these more rapidly, you need to create more books in this series, and a, a bunch of just the commonplace advice that we hear all the time now. They just, it wasn't commonplace back in 2016. Um, and he helped push me to uh, relaunch some books that I had launched that did nothing, and those books sold thousands and thousands of dollars since then. Um, those are, that's been one of my best-selling series, the Satori series. So it's usually not one thing, but it does, I do find that these things tend to happen like in, in, in bursts. Like you'll have these aha moments that just bring you up to the next level. And, and then, and, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, when I go to events like this, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the aha moment. I'm looking for the aha takeaway. I'm looking for the thing that, if I find, at this, at this point guys, if I find one thing from a conference, that moves the needle one percent. That's made my whole conference. That's everything I needed, and and so I'm constantly looking for the next the next jump, the next aha. Yes. I'm c I'm coming from 25 years of traditional publishing, and I'm having to relearn everything because I feel like nothing nothing I've done matters at this point. And so my question to you is, what would be your advice about launching to that new? Uh, in the audience, like what would be your best advice for transitioning what I have, have learned into this? Because I've got the storytelling, I can do the covers, et cetera, but I have no idea where to start with promotion. Okay, so I, um, I, I, I came from a, a kind of traditional background originally too. Um, and what you've already got a fair amount of mastery in probably is storytelling, because uh, you usually don't get published in, if you, unless you've got some storytelling chops. So I'm, I'm assuming you've already actually got some good storytelling skills, so that's one pillar you've got solid. You may need to do a little bit of unlearning when it comes to the productivity pillar, because, um, you know, like let's face it, traditional publishing really wants us to do a book a year and makes us think that if we're doing more than that, we're hacks. And uh, no, <laughs> that's definitely not the case. So uh, that may require a little extra effort and a little extra unlearning. Um, in terms of the promotional stuff, uh, the only single class that I fully recommend and endorse with no questions whatsoever is Mark Dawson's Ad for, uh, Ads for Authors class, um, which he's opening up sometime this winter, I think, like January or something like that. Um, it's expensive, it's worth it. He covers everything that you could possibly want to know about paid, paid marketing. Um, really, really solid material. Other than that, get on these groups and ask people, like, what are you doing? I need to do this actually with the Lit RPG folks because I need to pick some brains and say, like, uh, how do I actually get eyeballs on this stuff? Because it's a little bit different in that genre and I'm back to writing in it after some time off. Um, so go to the authors in your genre who are doing well and say, hey, can I buy you coffee? Can I buy you a beer or whatever your drink of choice is? And can I pick your brain about some cool stuff? You know, like what are you doing right now for marketing? What can I be doing to help push my stuff up? So that's always a good idea too. Yeah. Uh, with respect to book trailers for promotions, what are your thoughts on that? Because I've heard mixed messages uh, or at least mixed experience with using them. I've almost never heard somebody tell me that the book trailer earned back more than they spent on it. Um, almost always they're, uh, they're uh, a, a money sink that doesn't actually return on the investment all that well. Now there are exceptions to that. If you can do your own book trailer, um, and this is something you're doing for fun, make sure it's passing the Wibbo test. Would I be better off writing? Um, because, you know, like, if it would cost you $500 to have somebody make you a trailer, and the amount of time that you are wasting on making your own trailer is costing you $2,000 in writing time, it's probably better to hire somebody. But 
uh, most of the time book trailers are not all that effective because uh, we're competing against Hollywood, guys. We're competing against movie trailers. And if our book trailers don't look as good as the movie trailers, then uh, people think that it looks unprofessional. And, and that's, done not, that's not our fault, but it is our competition. We're competing for eyeballs on a trailer. We're competing with the next Avengers movie. We're competing with Free Guy. And we're competing with all of the hot new Hollywood films. And I can't compete with that. And I'm actually pretty good at art and video manip manipulation. I'm not that good, though. <laughs> all right, yes? Uh, you may have already covered this since I came in a little late, but I'll ask anyways. Uh, how important is market research as it pertains to genre when you're looking to build a sustainable career? Does that make sense? Market research as it, per give me a per as it pertains to genre. Like there's some genres that uh, overperform, some that underperform. Like how much work do you do before you ever start writing a book, before you ever implement any of this other stuff? How much of that goes into it? when you're planning out a book or a series, the genres and the markets that you're publishing in. Does that make sense? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Um, so, so nine years ago, I coined this expression that now everybody borrows. <laughs> if you take a Venn diagram <laughs> and you draw two big circles, and one of the circles is the things that you want to write about, and the other circle is the things that people want to read, where those two circles overlap, write that. The problem is figuring out what people actually want to read. And, and honestly, it, it can require a little bit of extra effort. So I'm getting back into writing some lit RPG books. I'm, I'm writing more science fiction, um, and I've been doing a bunch of urban fantasy, and now I'm kind of shifting gears and heading back into some lit RPG. Um, and before I settled back in to do some more lit RPG, uh, I, I looked at the genre, and I, I read a couple dozen books this year. Um, no, that's, that's, I'm serious. That's market research, guys. I, I, I read all of the books that are selling super well. Not just some of them. I read all of them because <laughs> I want to know why. What is it about these books that readers are loving so much? Because I want to deliver on that promise, too. And what I found is that, uh, you know, like the science fiction uh, lit RPG that I started writing is probably not center mass for this particular audience. And I, I learned that you know, like certain types, certain subsets of this genre are much more popular than others. And so I'm readjusting my aim, and I'm you know, targeting new stuff that's dead center mass, right in the middle of the target audience. So that, that way I can absolutely maximize my chances. Um, fortunately, it also happens to be in this part of the circle where I enjoy writing it. Because uh, for, for if you're not enjoying this job, go do something else. Really? It, 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 I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to say that, actually. Because there are some people out there who uh, write books that they don't care about and that they don't like and that they is in a genre that they would never enjoy reading. And they make good money at it. And they'd rather make good money doing that than something else. And that's fine. But for me. I want all of my books to be something that I really in, enjoy reading. I want them to be something that, that's fun for me to write. I want to challenge myself and push myself, but I also want to uh, I, I also want to write these things that they're exciting for me, that move me. And I'm really always looking for the, the places where that overlap exists, where the, the readers, where I, I'm, I'm maximizing my, my reader targeting but where I'm still inside of the circle of the things that I am really passionate about. I have another question. We have a minute. <laughs> One minute. Okay, so Mike Landerly often talks about minimally viable product. If, you mm -hmm. had a very, if you're new to this and you had a very small budget, and you had to pick one place to invest your money, great editor, great cover art, you know, ads, where would you invest a very small limited budget in your, in your pillar scheme? Ads. No question. And the, well, what I would do is I would do my, well, what I did when I started out was I did do my own covers. And some of the early ones were not that great. Um, I got better. <laughs> and I still do some of my own covers because I still enjoy it. I don't have to anymore. I can hire people, but I still enjoy it. So 
uh, editing. You can get friends to help you edit. You can get beta readers to help you edit. You can get arc teams to help you find your typos and stuff. Ideally, a paid editor is, uh, is perfect, but you can get by with a cheap cover for 25 bucks or, you know, and, and free, ad, free editing. You need eyeballs, though. All right, that's it for time, guys. Thank you all very, very much for coming.